and welcome to Four Wheels Good, the motor show which gives you the grand tour of everything from the horseless carriage to the hot rod and the kaleidoscope of artefacts betwixt and between. In today's show, Steve Vokens will be taking it easy in his Living With series with the hot sports Jaguar, the XJ8. Ian Royal will be test driving the most futuristic refuse lorry ever to roll off the production line. And John Wright will be getting right down to business with the spanners in Inside Motors. Now, have you ever wondered what sort of safety checks go into the development of a tyre before it ends up being the only thing between you and a patch of ice as you glide helplessly towards a tree? Well, scientists at Goodyear are determined that you shouldn't be helpless. Before any new tyre is brought onto the market, it's extensively tested in all conditions. And with winter tyre testing, you need the best wintry conditions. So we sent Richard Warren out to the freezing Alps in Switzerland to find out more. Well, it's white snow, it's ice, it's cold. No, we're not in Milton Keynes. We're in St Moritz in the middle of Switzerland. And we're here to drive some cars with very special tyres on. Welcome to everybody in Switzerland, in St. Maurice, for our Goodyear winter tyre session. I am enjoyed to see you this morning. The hill climbing think, section uh, we, we have made in the Albula Pass in Switzerland is mainly to assess the potential of a tyre for the traction and also in the different corners we have uh, on this uh, track, on, on this pass, uh, to assess the cornering force and uh, the stability in cornering on snow. It's just a snow traction test, mainly in the straight parts of the Albula Pass, but also we assess subjectively uh, the, the, uh, the cornering behaviour and the handling behaviour in cornering. And with professional drivers going at high speed, the tyres really do go through a rigorous test. Quite a hair-raising ride as well, with the added danger of all those shear drops just feet away. <laughs> so welcome to Tsuos for acceleration braking test. Another vital test performed with the winter tyres is measuring the efficiency of them during acceleration and braking. The times are recorded on a separate piece of apparatus that's attached to the car as it accelerates and brakes on very slippery snow. This is a very important test for us uh, because it assesses really the traction on this flat area, depending on the type of snow we have characterized. It's not uh, in uh, slope, it's just uh, flat, and uh, we can test there uh, in different conditions. We try to characterize all this type of snow. We are very careful in, in uh, making the proper characterization in terms of uh, crystals, but in terms of uh, mechanic properties of the snow, the different layers, and uh, the, the type of packaging, of, uh, of packing, sorry, of the, of the snow. So all these parameters have to be carefully analyzed, and based on that, we try to correlate with the different performance of our tires. So with the different parameters we have analyzed with our weather station, we can see the evolution of the different crystal on the snow. And to verify that, we have the possibility on a very rough characterization with this type of table, with the different picture of the main crystal you can encounter here on the track. So I can take a small samples and basically I can analyze that, the size of the particles, and I just have a look to the different particles of snow and crystals and I can associate the image I see to what is listed here in the pictures. So in this case we have this type of particles available. So it's made fine grains and already wet grains. 
Also, you have all these metrological items around the, the wind speed and the temperature. Is that really essential to your testing as well? Absolutely. Uh, all these parameters they influence, uh, let's say, on an hour by hour, sometimes minutes by minutes, uh, the conditions of, of the tracks. And we have really, uh, each set we pass, each set of tires, I mean, uh, we, we put on the car and we test, we have to check if there is no special evolution of the track. And uh, in this respect, we need really to analyze and to know the temperature, the humidity, all these key parameters uh, we, we can see with this weather station we have on each side. The final very important test is on ice. Not just on an icy road, but on a frozen lake. Here we have wind, we have the different type of uh, level of humidity and all these uh, characteristics are changing during our test. And this is really real life, I mean this is where the tires will have to, uh, to make the performance uh, when the, the customer will uh, buy it. Now we can have some assessment of the potential of a tire on a nice rink. Definitely we do that, but it's not sufficient. We have really to assess the tire on site once the predictive testing have been made. A gentleman who does know a lot more about driving on ice and winter conditions is Luc Gagny, who's the editor-in-chief of Le Monde du Auto. And Luc, obviously uh, this is a bit of a holiday for you, but uh, yeah. what, are the, what are the driving conditions like in Canada? Actually, they would be close to what we have here. Lots of snow on the road, possibility of ice once in a while, black ice, the dangerous one. Uh, conditions similar to here. Well, obviously, we've been driving a variety of cars today, so would you say that the new tyre that Goodyear got, the winter tyre, is it actually an improvement over a standard uh, sort of tyre or not? Actually, yes, the Ultra Group 5 is a tyre that provides a good balance of qualities for the average driver, I would say. Uh, it provides good grip in the snow, good handling overall, and uh, not too many surprises. When you actually launch a new tyre, how long does it take for you to actually develop it and then put it actually into production and get it onto a car? Oh, it's evolved a lot. I mean, uh, 15 years ago it was made maybe two years or two years and a half. I think now uh, it's much, much reduced and it's due to the fact that we go through different tests in different places and also because our predictive testing is much, much more efficient. The main thing for a driver is to get an experience, to feel the vehicle he drives and to learn how to, to manipulate, to maneuver the vehicle. Uh, people in Canada sometimes go into a shopping mall, a parking lot, when it's empty naturally, after a snowstorm, just to feel the movement of the car, how it handles in the snow, on ice, just to be ready when that situation occurs on the highway, on the motorway. So that would be a little uh, advice I would give to any driver. That really does look like great fun, but I think I'll steer clear of that frozen lake. I thought I heard the ice cracking. Now, if one of your favourite childhood fantasies was to drive the huge dust carts that came down your street once a week collecting the contents of your bin, then look no further. You may just develop pangs of that longing once again. Sed and Atkinson have just unleashed the most advanced dust cart ever, and Ian Royal went to live a boyhood dream. As a young boy, cars and trucks were always a great fascination for me. I used to say, when I grew up, I wanted to be a bus driver, a lorry driver, drive a racing car, some glamorous and some not so glamorous occupations. But there was always one thing that I wanted to do, drive a dustbin lorry, or should we say, a refuse vehicle. Well, today I get to realise my ambition. But this is no ordinary dustbin lorry. It's a revolutionary new vehicle from Seddon Atkinson, and it's this, the leader. Now what do the Leader and the McLaren F1 road car have in common? Surely nothing you might think. Well, there's one important design that both of these vehicles share and it's this, the central steering column and the seats behind. The McLaren F1 road car might do 0 to 60 in about 3 seconds. The Leader might take a little longer I think. But the Leader certainly beats the McLaren hands down when it comes to street cleaning performance. So the automatic gearbox you just simply put into drive, we're in, give it some revs, take the air brake off. Oh I see, ah, it's easy when you know how. And 
off we go. Boy, you can see me driving this now, you will be so, so jealous. Now, Mark, Sed and Atkinson have developed this new leader. Uh, tell us why it's revolutionary, it's been described as revolutionary, uh, and why you've developed it. Well, as you probably know, Ian, Sed and Atkinson are a very major player in the UK municipal vehicle market, and with its centre steering position low and low access cab, the leader is particularly suitable for any environment where repeated stops and starts are necessary and where both the driver and the crew may have to repetitively get out of and back into the cab. Um, as you can see, the low steering position and low access points make the leader uniquely suitable. What sort of features are standard on the leader for the, for the driver and the crew? Well, in addition to an easy clean cab which is tailored to the municipal environment, Ian, um, the uh, cab includes one or two of life's creature comforts, it's well upholstered as you can see, and in addition to that uh, we've included uh, closed circuit television to assist driver reversing and a, a radio cassette configuration to keep him entertained. Mark, let's take a look around the leader and see what some of the main features are, can we? Certainly, come on. Okay, and so as you can see, um, we have this rather large cooling package attached to the side of the vehicle here. Um, due to the low driving position and the low floor in the cab, it's obviously impossible to mount the radiator in its normal position at the front of the vehicle frame. So we've had this um, package specially developed, which includes both the radiator at the back and the intercooler here. Um, unlike a, a normal commercial vehicle which drives the fan either by belts or directly off the engine, this one's actually driven by an hydraulic motor. That in turn is powered by a pump on the vehicle's gearbox. Now for the mechanics in maintenance, uh, when the leader comes back in for its regular service, oil and water is easy, easy for them to get to there? That's right, and so is the cab tilt pump here. So just show us what you're actually doing here, Mark, and explain as we go through. Well, basically we have a small hydraulic pump which powers two rams under the cab and that enables the cab to be tilted without the use of any crane or external device so that you can get to the, the engine and gearbox for maintenance purposes. So it's simply a matter of just pumping it and pumping it and pumping it and eventually the cab will, will start to tilt out. Oh. That's right, yes. And there she goes, beginning to tilt now. There you go. And that, of course, give, gives easy access to the engine and you can, uh, you can be working on the engine as well. How far does the cab actually go over? Well, actually, uh, I think it tilts to 50 degrees in total. Now, Mark, what's so different about the chassis on the leader? Well, as you can see, whereas a normal commercial vehicle chassis passes almost to the front of the vehicle, the leader's low cab and low driving position necessitates that we end the frame just behind the front wheels here, and that the cab and part of the front suspension are carried on these two subframes. Also, the engine is mounted slightly further back along the chassis and a little bit lower than normal. It's a huge engine, 8.3 litres? That's right, but you have to remember that although uh, municipal vehicles spend a lot of time wandering village and town streets. Um, they're given quite a job to do on certain landfill sites where the gradients can become quite high. We've come inside the cab of the new leader now to see what's so different about it and perhaps Jonathan you can just run through the main points that make it so different, so revolutionary from a normal refuse vehicle. Well basically with you sitting in the middle the vision either side of the, the doors is good and the mirrors, the visibility for the mirrors is much easier than a, a normal right hand drive vehicle. And what sort of comforts do, does the driver get and the passengers get? Well, they get air assisted seats in these ones so you can have air out or put the air back in. You can sit, put the seat as high as you want it, as low as you want it. Adjustable steering column. All the controls are nice and handy. Gearbox there, handbrake there, nice and easy to get to. And how does it actually drive out on the road? What, is, it, is it different at all to drive from a, from a normal vehicle? Oh yeah, it's different to drive. You have to tend to drive it more like a left hand drive vehicle. Or you drive to the curb rather than to what to the white lines when you first get in it. If you haven't driven it before, you tend to wander over to the right as it's normal to do so. Well, perhaps you can take us out for a drive and let's see how it actually goes on the road. Yes, no problem.
Well, I think I'll stick with the McLaren F1. That's it for part one, but join us again after the break to see how Steve Vokens has been getting on living with another car, the Jaguar XJ8. Welcome back to Four Wheels Good. From Alpha to Westfield and beyond, we bring you what's best in the motoring world. As you know, Steve Vokens has been living with cars from week to week to really get a feel for them. This week, it's his pleasure to be living with something that combines classic British looks with the power of a V8 engine, Jaguar's XJ8. My latest assignment is an eight-day appraisal of the Jaguar XJ8 Saloon. Live with it, they said. Go and have some fun. Treat it as your own car. Do some nice things with it. Oh dear, this is going to be difficult. That's nice. Very nice. Good grief, there's so much in this car. It's a real flight deck. Lovely wooden leather. I'm going to enjoy getting to grips with this car, I can see. This is Jaguar's XJ8 4-litre saloon using the normally aspirated AJ8 engine. This 32-valve, 4-valve per cylinder block develops a thundering 290 brake horsepower. Mated to a 5-speed auto box and using traction control, it hurtles itself towards the horizon in a blazing 6.5 seconds 0-60 with a top speed of 150 miles per hour and costs in the region of £40,000. I've been enjoying this car for four days now, and enjoying is definitely the right word. It's a great car to have outside the house. It's amazing how many friends you have when you turn up in a car like this. It's also an incredibly rewarding drive. On the downside, my only two complaints are about the wisdom of choosing those wheels, which look out of place in a car of this quality, and also the turning circle, which could be tighter. I found my three-point turns turning into five or even seven-point nightmares. By the eighth day, I'd covered close on 1,500 miles in glorious air-conditioned comfort, alternating between the stereo and the fabulous V8 engine noise for company. Apart from the music coming from the engine compartment, my other lasting impressions were of the sheer quality of the car, its finish, the way it felt, and its subtle and understated elegance. This is a British car we can be proud of. Economical too. Average MPG, according to my computerised captain's log, was just under 21. Overall then, a fabulous car, and one I really didn't want to give back. Now where can I lay my hands on the spare 40 odd grand? A really refined vehicle with all the power of a supercar. It's a surprise to find it costing less than a BMW 535i. We'll see Steve again in next week's show. It's time now to close our eyes, tap our feet together and say there's no place like Inside Motors. Take that off. Right, now we'll take out the push rods and you always give them a wiggle before they come out. Now, you can tell this is a bit of an old engine. I'll just bring them in front of the camera here because the push rods have got a bit rusty. Now, that's probably because this engine hasn't run for at least 10 years, if not a bit longer. 
but we'll soon cure that and that's not going to be a huge problem to us. <coughs> right, now we're going to take these bolts off here and then we'll be able to lift the head clear. Right, now we'll lift the head off. Just get me a Birmingham screwdriver again. Quick tap there. Quick tap there. And it should come clear. That's it. Right. Yeah. Back down there. Move it off my hand. Turn it round so you can have, so you can have a look. Yeah, that is going to clean up superbly well. Quite pleased with that. Now we'll get rid of the old gasket and we'll start stripping the bottom end of the engine down. And I think before we start doing that, I might just see if there's any oil in the sump. We'll get rid of that first. Right, viewers, regular viewers to the show know that we use this big 30 litre barrel to drain oil into. And then once a week, I take it to the tip and dispose of the oil properly. wash it got it lovely right there's a little bit of oil in there it doesn't look too bad actually yeah i don't like that i don't know what it is but i don't particularly like that in the sump anyway when we strip the engine down we'll find out exactly what that is right let's get rid of this of that later and we can get back to what we really came for which is getting rid of all this I think before I start taking the sump off I just get rid of these two cover plates and the breather system thanks there to our performer of mechanical marvels John Wright I'm afraid that once again it's time to say hasta la vista, but join us next week when Ian Royal drives an amazing supercar from Nissan, Richard Warren finds out what goes on at ProDrive, the force behind the Subaru Rally and Honda Touring Car teams, Steve Okins will be driving the Peugeot 406 Coupe, and John Wright will be getting handy again in Inside Motors. See you then. <laughs>